So, good morning. This is Helmut speaking at Approval Max. And I would suggest we are starting our webinar now. Um, Luis, if you would please switch on your camera. Yes, hi. Hello. Good Hello. morning, Luis. Nice to meet you. Um, early in the morning, uh, UK time. And uh, yeah, our audience, obviously, a little bit uh, far east from us. So it's almost afternoon or close uh, to the end of the business day. I want to welcome um, you to our webinar today. And uh, this webinar is the continuation of our best practice series. And uh, we want to talk about uh, best practices on providing advisory services for technology startups and international subsidiaries. And our guest speaker today is Luis Padridge. Hi, Luis, again. Hi, Helmut. Hello, audience. Good. Um, Luis has been delivering uh, a bespoke outsourced accountancy services and advice to early stage technology businesses since long, long time, since 1999. And uh, Luis shares um, her spirit and experience and make her experienced ideal partner to guide companies through all stages of the startup phase, growth and exit. Luis, um, would you please tell us a little bit more about uh, your firm? Yes, of course, Helmut. Um, so um, Mary Hill Accountancy uh, was established in 1999. So that's 20 years of delivering our services, which has gone in the blink of an eye. Um, and we provide outsource accounts function services to um, only to companies. We don't do any work with sole traders uh, and they are primarily in the tech software and consulting sector. Um, they're often start up an early stage, but, but sometimes we keep clients for really quite a long time. We can have 10, 15 year relationships while we're, we're supporting them with their accounts function. We help a lot of international groups with their UK subsidiaries. That's a, a particular area of experience of ours. We're a small team of nine uh, and we have approximately 30 clients, which is quite a small number for, for an accounting practice. But because of the services we're, we're offering, uh, full outsource accounts function, um, we, we're involved in really every every part of their day-to-day -day accounting. So we, it's a very high touch service, lots and lots of contact with the customer, which means it's obviously that is reflected in um, the size of the portfolio. Um, to give the, the um, audience some context around us as a practice and, and the services we offer, uh, I would say that less than 20% of our fee income is from financial statements and corporation tax, which in the UK would be considered the real core and classic, um, you know, accounting compliance services. Um, a good 50% of our fee revenue derives from what is often described as bookkeeping tasks. Although, in my opinion, bookkeeping doesn't really adequately describe um, the depth of service that we're providing as a full outsource accounts function. A sort of insight into our client range, our, our smallest client would be a sole director consultancy practice um, with a turnover at probably 50 to 100,000 GBP and, and we might spend about an hour a week on them as a client and then our largest client in fact currently uh, we look after all the European um, purchase ledger and expense processing for a um, a UK subsidiary and associated companies of um, a US listed software company. And we are currently delivering about 35 hours a week of, of accounting and bookkeeping tasks for them. So hopefully that gives you a nice idea of who we are, what we do and who we do it for. Yeah, it sounds like uh, a boutique service uh, for bookkeeping services and accounting services. Um, with a, a variety of different client profiles. But Luis, um, what are the common challenges and the demand you see in your clients? Yes, so let's, let's start with challenges. Um, so 
good communication it, it is always a challenge and it's something that we work really hard at um, there's lots of reasons why it can be a challenge um, with, with this particular you know working with international parent companies English might not be the first language so we're having conversations and dialogues and indeed emails with with people often in what is a foreign language for them so we have to be very mindful of that um, quite often we, we don't meet our contacts in person so we use video calls a lot we have long relationships with people over years and we might actually have never met them and then usually when we do meet them everybody gets very excited um, so the communication and the developing the relationships definitely takes time and we absolutely work on that uh, dealing with startups they need lots of hand-holding you know sort of understandable the um the overseas companies if they're expanding into the uk I, I always like to say they don't know what they don't know they don't know so we have to sort of gently guide them and tell them the yeah. things they don't know they don't know but but actually even uk companies the inexperienced founders you, these guys you know they're entrepreneurs and they're business leaders but they don't necessarily know anything about accounting or the UK accounting and compliance regime. So lots of handholding. Uh, where we inherit clients, a pretty big challenge is that the quality of the bookkeeping account and accounting can be really surprisingly poor. Uh, and that's something that that's, it, it's unfortunate to see that there isn't a better quality of accounting and bookkeeping out there. Demands from clients, well, they want top, top quality customer service. They, they want us to be super responsive. You know, nobody wants to wait for anything anymore. And that's just the way of the world. And it's particularly the way of, you know, tech and startup companies. They want us to have a really good understanding of their business. And actually, they, they want something that is bespoke to them and is, is right for now. So yeah. there you go. That's challenges and demands. Yeah, uh, obviously language barrier may be uh, a big problem, but uh, I believe uh, in end of the day, what counts uh, is uh, the service and advisory uh, you can give to your clients with your expertise. Um, and uh, I mean, moving to advisory service is a hot topic, uh, which is often discussed today what is your view in accounting and advisory and especially contrasting uh, those two? Well, I, I've never really had the need to diversify into advisory because we, we don't see it as, as a separate activity to our core services. Um, I, I feel that everything we do is advisory in the sense that it, it adds value and the opportunities to add value and help a client arise naturally from being involved in the underlying accounting and, and having a very close relationship and, uh, you know, really understanding the client's business. So you, if you look at advisory as being anything that helps the client run their business successfully, that could be a really complicated business forecast. And, you know, that is classically seen to be an advisory activity. And we might well do that for client, but in fact, running great accounting processes in which their employees get paid on time is advisory. Running a really clean, well-run purchase ledger in which you're supplying, uh, paying your suppliers on time, you know, not too early, not too late, uh, and your costs are controlled, that's advisory. So we don't really see the distinction because advisory for us is woven through absolutely everything we do we think the small things are really important they're they're just as important as the big things and because we're involved in every aspect of the client's business and the accounting for the business it just means we're in a position to make suggestions and and have really insightful conversations with them yeah so um, you mentioned uh, becoming a trusted advisor is a natural part uh, of your business or becoming uh, the trusted advisor for your clients. Um, so what it takes to become such an advisor? Well, I, I think we're in a fantastic position to become a trusted advisor because we are there with them every day, every week, 
doing the things that need to be done to keep the business ticking over, to keep the accounting for the business ticking over. So we're developing these really close relationships with the client. And, and I think being a trusted advisor, it, that's part of the foundation is you, you have to have a great relationship. Um, it, for us, it just evolves naturally out of what we do and how we do it. And, and, and we know that they, they see us as trusted advisors because they tell us that they come and ask our advice rather than going to uh, perhaps other professionals that they could go to. Um, the things we do that I think helps that happen, we communicate with them a lot every week, every day. You know, it, it's so important for what we're doing. It, if we only talk to a client two or three times a year, it's really difficult to give them insights and suggestions. We're very proactive. We take ownership of their accounting. So we, we kind of, we nag them if we have to. We're not, we're not reactive, we're very proactive. We try to do the best job we can all the time. Now we don't always manage it, obviously, but actually clients really appreciate the effort. We're very honest with them, even when it's not what they want to hear. Uh, we're very generous with our advice and, and it's, it's amazing clients often, they, they just want to be told what to do. They don't want you to sit on the fence or pontificate. And I'll say, well, what would you do? So we are usually happy to tell them. Uh, and we really work at the people relationships. We, we're talking to some of our clients m multiple times a day. So, you know, it's like a work colleague or a marriage. You, you really have to get on with these people and, and you, you have to work at it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good uh, comparison with the marriage. Um, but Louis, um, if you are looking on uh, the client relationship, do you see any um, common pattern, uh, any cycle um, of the client relationship journey? Well, yes, I mean, what, what happens is that, that we, we start to engage with the prospect and we start to have a conversation with them about what, what they want and what we do and, and do those fit together. Um, so, so we're, we, we're offering a tailored solution and that, that will often evolve over time. So yes. at the start, we will, we'll take a lot of time talking to prospective clients to really go through a discovery process to understand them, the business, what they think they need, um, what they think we do versus what we can actually do for them. So, so we, t we, we take them on a journey. O often we're going to make suggestions that will completely change their accounting processes. So it, it takes a while for them to become comfortable with that. Uh, uh, in fact, our most recent client, we've spent about six months before they ended up sort of saying, yes, we'll engage with you because they couldn't, you know, it took them a long time to work out what did they want? What didn't they want? Who was going to do what bit of activity? Were they going to do some in house? Were we going to do some of it? And it's really important not to rush that because it, it you know, people don't like to feel pressured. Um, in terms of, deciding what services they want to adopt. We're, we're, we're very open, we're very flexible. We'll say you, you, can, you can take this service, you can not take it. But what tends to happen is as they, as they develop a relationship with us and as they develop trust, they'll just say, oh, could you do that as well? Or could you do that bit too? Actually, I know we said we'd keep that bit, but, but you know, this is great and I'm really busy and actually if you could do it, that would be fantastic. So that, that's, the, that's the typical profile is that, you know, we might start quite small and then they just keep asking us to do more things. Yeah. Okay, um, Luis, um, let's switch uh, to the technology and uh, ask the question, so uh, what software you are using uh, for your clients, with your clients, and uh, how you are selecting the software? for each client. Okay, so uh, unlike quite a lot of practices, we, we don't have a standard stack. We don't ro roll out a standard stack of apps to every client. We have apps that we really like to work with and we will make suggestions, but what we try to do is think about what's right for the client. And then we will, we will suggest something. So we'll bring in a sort of a, 
a bundle of tools that we think works for them. In terms of selecting those tools, that you know, there's no there's no really structured process. What, what tends to happen is that I go to things like ZeroCon and AccountX and my team watch and they read things and they'll say, oh, that's interesting. Let's have a look at that. And if we, yeah. if we see an app that we like, we'll, um, what we'll tr always try and do, if possible, is we'll try and use it in-house. We'll try and really play with it, understand it, because it's much harder to recommend something to a client if you don't really understand how it works. So we tend to try and kick, kick it about in house first. And, and then when we decide that it, we like it and we understand it, we'll, we'll make suggestions to clients, but it's, it's, it's really quite bespoke. And the other thing is we, we're, we're getting clients, we get the international clients might already have a bunch of things they're using. And at that point, they're not going to take a suggestion from us. If the whole group is using Concur for expense management, yeah. then clearly the UK subsidiary is going to use Concur for expense management. So we have to be flexible and adaptable and be prepared to use what the client wants us to use. Yeah, that's a very interesting view. Um, and uh, I believe that explains also um, the wide range of tools and apps uh, you are using uh, in your app stack uh, for your clients. Um, if you uh, think about the Prover Max, uh, obviously you are using a Prover Max for your clients. What is your experience uh, with a Prover Max? What are the typical use cases when you and your clients need a Prover Max? Okay, so we we first came across Approval Max. Um, it's a three or four years ago, and and it was absolutely you know classic app discovery i was wandering around i think it was accountex which is the that's the the uk's largest um, accounting trade show just in case yeah. our australian and new zealand listeners aren't aware and um we're always keeping our eye out for things that might be interesting and as a as a third party provider in which we're right in the guts of basically spending money for a client, we're running purchase ledger, we're managing expenses, we're facilitating payments. It's really, really important for us that we have a robust approval process and audit trail. You know, actually every business should have a robust approval process and audit trail, but if you're a third party provider, you've just got to be extra cautious. And we'd really be managing on email, which is okay. But, you know, it's not great. It's not a bespoke tool. Yeah. So when we spotted Approval Max, we thought, oh, that really could be quite interesting. Um, and so then we did our, our usual due diligence. We tested it in-house. We played with it, decided that we liked it. Um, and then we started to roll it out to selected clients. Um, now, the, the thing that we've discovered with Approval Max is it, it's a great tool for approve it audit tra um, approval audit trails. It allows for quite complex workflows, which means you can start small with a client, really simple approval process. And as they scale, if they want more complex approval flows, then approval maps can accommodate them. Um, but really interestingly, clients really like it and it really drives their behavior. So historically, you'd have clients where you were chasing them on email to approve something and you can't get traction with them. You can't get their attention. They're busy. They're doing other things. They're growing their business. Mm. But there's something about the way Approval Max works, the, the email reminders, the really visual interface that they, they just respond better to it. There's, there's probably a whole psychology thesis in there somewhere yeah. so once we started using it we just actually found that it was really really good my team really like it and the clients really like it so so increasingly we now use it we will once a client becomes bigger than a certain size we will suggest it as as a um, you know an approval workflow tool and clients are very happy to adopt it so it's our kind of standard rollout now uh, particularly with clients on zero because of course there's a great in integration um, and it, it it just helps to oil that whole purchase invoice process which is really where we're using it we're using it for purchase invoices yeah 
Interesting. Thank you very much uh, for the great feedback. And uh, I'm very happy about uh, the good adoption. And this is obviously what uh, our developers are aiming for, uh, making an intuitive uh, product which does not distract, but uh, it is just used uh, while the customer runs its business. Um, Luis, can you give us a live example of your approach and uh, walk us through a client case study? Yes, of course. So the client that we're talking about on the slide is it's actually a, a Swedish software company and we look after the UK subsidiary and we we acquired them we inherited them from another uk practice just over two years ago and they had a headcount in the uk of about 15. Um, so we knew immediately that we wanted to to put in place a, a structured purchase invoice approval tool so we recommended approval max to them uh, and they were very happy to adopt it we 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 rolled it out, implemented it in, in a quite a, um, a basic form. So, you know, obviously uh, the sales office in the UK headcount at 15, they didn't want to have particularly complicated approval structures. So probably just two or three approvers covering all transactions. Uh, now that, that business is, is growing very rapidly. So m more recently, uh, the, the headquarters has, has looked at all of their corporate governance across all of their subsidiaries, their headquarters, and the, they've got a number of sus subsidiaries in various countries. And they have developed quite a, um, a structured um, purchasing and procurement model, which requires more sophisticated approval wor workflows. And we were delighted to, to be able to say that, well, actually, Approval Max will still be able to accommodate that. So about six months ago, we, we, we developed and scoped what, what the new sort of corporate governance model would look like in Approval Max. And that, that is a, a up to a three layer um, approval workflow with including um, spend thresholds. Uh, and we've successfully rolled that out and the client's very happy with it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what have been the challenges the client needed to be addressed and how were they addressed? Well, I think initially when, when we first rolled out Approval Max, it, it, it's quite straightforward. You know, there are 15 people. Um, there's a, a number of purchase invoice transactions every month to deal with. And to a certain extent, you, you can you can manage that manually if somebody's on holiday you know you can manually reroute the workflow that's that's relatively straightforward um, as the business has grown and in fact they've moved into much bigger offices which is always a trigger for much more um, purchase ledger activity we've had to put in they've asked us to put in place a more sophisticated uh, sort of work workflow scheme and I, I guess one of the challenges is the, the client will say we'd like to do x and then you've got to work out what does that actually mean how do you take their vision and structure that and then it and then implement it through the tool so that involves you know conversations and discussions dealing with the exceptions there are always exceptions it's just inevitable um but you know we we've we've found that there's been enough flexibility there and and it's actually rolled out very successfully yeah. And if you are thinking about three things to select as an advice from the field, what would you point out for your audience? Um, so the, I guess my three bits of advice would be, you know, be generous with knowledge and experience. We, we, we're always being generous with our time and our knowledge and experience. And, and, and I know there are practices that would be saying, well, you know, you're giving away something that you could be charging for, but what we're getting back is a relationship, an ongoing relationship, recurring fee revenue at, you know, quite significant levels. We're getting referrals, recommendations, uh, we're, you know, and we're building trust, which is just a fantastic foundation. Um, we, I would also recommend investing time and effort in, in the client relationship and understanding the business, you know, in a way you can, 
you can never know too much about a client's business. Um, and then I suppose my final point is that, you know, a, a advisory services, well, actually in our services, which are largely bookkeeping, really doesn't do it justice, that word, but it, it's like a, it's like a marriage, you know, so daily and close collaboration with the clients mm. really, really important. Yeah. Marriage in going through good and through bad times, but uh, keeping up the relationship. <laughs> Absolutely. And how much there, you know, there are bad times with clients. And, and, yeah. and when we have, when something like that happens, I always say to this team, okay, now, now we have to lean in. Now we have to love bomb them yes. to, try and, to try and improve things. <laughs> Yeah, uh, obviously, Louis, I believe uh, Dick success proof you're right, and uh, I'm very happy about that. Um, I think we are approaching uh, um, the, um, uh, uh, we are going closer to the end of the show. And uh, let me, um, before we are starting to the Q&A session, um, remind the audience that uh, if you are interested to learn more uh, about our series uh, of advisory um, services um, by Approver Max, then please check out uh, the upcoming XU Magazine issue 21 and as well as our blog. And uh, if you are uh, happen to be in the UK next month, um, visit us at XeroCon London um, if you cannot make it uh, to the Xerocon London, um, there may be a good option that we show up uh, in Australia pretty soon uh, for any event. Uh, and uh, for sure, next September, we will be again there. Um, I would suggest we switch to the Q&A session. And uh, before we answer your questions, um, let me just give you um, a uh, a tip. So if you move your mouse uh, over the Zoom window, you will find a button which is called uh, Q&A or labeled Q&A. Click this button, please, uh, and uh, type your questions there. Um, while we are waiting for questions, I want to share a feedback we have received from Brian. And uh, Louis Brian is essentially saying that uh, he fully agrees uh, with uh, your opinion and uh, his experience is the same. Um, so Brian is saying that clients generally lack the experience in the area of accounting and finance and want to be led to the solution. I believe uh, that is a big part of your day-to-day -day work. Yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I, the, the, there's a risk that professionals don't, don't want to be, they want to stay on the fence. They don't always want to give an opinion, but actually lo lots of clients, they just, they just, they want to know this. What do you think? What would you do? And, and I, I guess we, we try to have the courage to tell them, even when they don't always like the answer. <laughs> yes, yes, obviously. Okay, so we got the first question from David and David is asking about, um, uh, so how did you get your first client and how would you advise someone starting out with a new practice to get a client in the startup okay. space? <laughs> Okay, so I'd, I'd like to tell you that there's a real secret formula to this, but I, I'm not sure there is. So I, um, I, I sort of fell into having an accountancy practice. I, uh, a quick background, I, my original um, background training is um, I've got a master's in engineering, but I decided that I didn't really want to be an engineer, but I was really interested in business. So I, I know I'll go and train as a chartered accountant, but what I'll do is I'll qualify and leave because I want to go back into, into industry and business. And, and effectively, that is what I did. I trained with one of the big firms in audit, in which you get no experience in terms of you know, accounts function accounting, really. Um, but I, I did, I qualified and I left, and I happened to fall into a software business. So that is how I, I guess, got my first sort of experience in software and tech. And as it happens, as shortly after I joined, they floated on the NASDAQ and then they expanded into Europe and I ended up running their European operations. So I was that whole multiple subsidiaries thing, got experience there. Um, so that was how I cut my teeth in software, yeah. but also cut my teeth in terms of understanding how, the, how an accounts function works. And then 
when I started a family, oh, my children are now grown up, um, I was just approached by somebody saying, would you like to get involved in supporting tech startups? So that's not very helpful for the question, I'm afraid, but it was, it was, it was a bit of luck. It was a tailwind. It was a spotting an opportunity. It was saying yeah. yes. Now, in terms of getting clients since, all our clients come from recommendation and word of mouth. We don't do any advertising. We, we're quite niche. We've worked out who we are, what we do, who we do it for. We really work at the relationships. We, we keep in touch with people for years. You can never get off the Merry Hill Accountancy Christmas card list once you've made it onto it. But, but, but it kind of works. And, and people, people buy from people and people talk to each other. And if you do a good job, they'll, they'll tell other people. So th there's no sign. I know that's not that's not agreeing with any of the sort of marketing strategies, but it works for us. Um, and we, we, I mean, the, our growth in the last couple of years has really started to escalate as I've really started mm. to push the, the kind of the networking and, and just, just talking about what we do and why we think it's really important. Yeah. 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 Obviously um, I think uh, recommendation word of mouth is a very powerful uh, instrument or a very powerful yeah. tool when it comes to um, being a trusted advisor and uh, I mean, uh, clients speaking about this experience to other potential clients, um, most likely the uh, most powerful tool. Thank you for sharing these insights with us. Um, we got another question, maybe a little bit sensitive, not sure um, if you can uh, openly answer it um, okay. uh, on this show, but um, the question from Mark is how to charge your clients. So how you determine appropriate fees, yeah. given you don't, you don't know the scope of the work early yeah. in the relationship. Yeah, yeah. I, right. I'm really, I have no problem with talking about this and sharing. You know. And again, it, it's, it's, it's not really a science. So we, we, we do timesheets. I know that there are sections of the community that, that think that's passe, but actually we do timesheets because it, it helps us manage workloads as much as anything else. And, and we do have some clients on time-based billing because that's what they want. But we have over yeah. the years, we have developed a, a pricing metric that's quite specific to our types of clients and it's based on <coughs> account. And, and the argument goes, if you're doing a full outsource accounts function, bookkeeping role, the more people they have, the more activity there is. So, so, so we have these kind of, we have a, like a, a retainer, which covers things like, you know, the software tools we're delivering, and then we're charging them on a per capita basis. So as they grow, uh, the, the charges go up, although the per capita rate goes down as they get bigger because you get economies of scale. So once we have a client in steady state, we, we've been doing it quite a long time. We, we, the pricing's pretty much sorted. We mostly don't have a problem. When we get a new client, particularly if it's an existing business and we need to sort of whip them into shape a bit, we, we make a huge fee investment in the first three to six months. Our recovery's not great. And I've just come to terms with that. It's, it's part of investing in the client. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we uh, it's it's really it's really structured. The clients, I guess, they know what they're going to get. The bit that's really hard is when we're not very good at doing a stripped down service. So I mean, you know, we don't do bronze, silver, gold. We just do gold all the yeah. time. And yeah. and actually, if if the fee, if we're struggling to justify yeah. gold with the fee, we we just don't like doing anything other than gold. So we slightly take it on the chin and then maybe six months in ask them if we could do a bit of a price increase. Yeah. So, but I believe that is a good base for building a long-term relationship. Um, and uh, obviously, um, yeah, when the relationship starts, um, making uh, some investments is required on your side as the vendor. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I, my, this, the, the, our most recent client, which in fact we inherit, we've just inherited from a full-time in, in-house um, qualified accountant uh, and the bookkeeping was not very good. Mm. Um, our our reco fee recovery in the first three months is about 35%, which is really not very good at all. Oh. 
but we're doing all the accounts function for a business that's got a turnover of 10 million and we hope to do that for the next maybe five plus years so i'm absolutely looking at the lifetime value of the contract and not at you know the, what i'm recovering today and the the brownie point you know the, the they they value the investor they reckon i tell them i tell them what our recovery is i have those conversations so yeah. that they know you know this is like an you know I go, you're a startup and I am effectively investing in you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. yeah, but obviously um, that is also where technology comes uh, in, the, uh, in the game, right? So once you are setting up uh, your processes and uh, introducing uh, the tools uh, which you need for a day-to-day -day work, uh, efficiency kicks in and you get the return, obviously. Well, I, yes, I mean, it is down to the tools, but it's also down to the relationship because yeah. actually, um, actually what we probably spend three to six months doing is training the client. Yeah, processes. Is checking, it is processes. Yeah. yeah, so processes are as important as the tools. And of course the tools sit across the processes and inform the processes, but it's kind of all of it. So yeah. you can have all the tools you like, but if you can't get a client to respond to you or read below bullet point two of a really important email, then it's very difficult. So we we do a lot of client training. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they know that, it, that it's happening to them. It's probably not a surprise to them. Yeah. So. Yeah. A related question from uh, Leslie uh, has arrived, uh, and uh, Leslie is asking. Uh, so when you are providing your services. Um, do you find there is any sweet spot in terms of billing period? Um, so are you billing your clients on a monthly, quarterly or annual basis? Um, how you handle this? Oh, so without question, monthly, every month. We're, we're yeah. So our core services, we're, we're, we're billing monthly. Yeah. Um, you know, where we're doing things like financial statement work, which, I mean, I've already said that is not a huge piece of our revenue. We bill that when it's completed even if it takes six months to get it completed because the client's being slow or whatever, yeah. but it kind of almost, that doesn't matter because our, our bread and butter revenue is, is flowing in every month. And of course the big advantage of running their full accounts function is that you are also running their supplier payment runs, which means that we never worry about getting paid. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. <laughs> Luis, um, last question from me uh, to you is, how do you see the future of your practice? So where you want to be and uh, where you want to develop? Well, I'm, I, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm driving the practice um, and there are, there are a couple of reasons for that. You know, one is I worked out quite a long time ago that you, you can't half-heartedly run a a business you it, it's very difficult it's a bit all or nothing and if you take take your foot off the accelerator pedal you you turn around one day and every, everybody's gone past you so it, it it's pushing all the time um and also our our clients they can have a natural life cycle if they're a tech business and they grow and they're successful uh, two things might happen one is they get so big they decide to hire in-house although that doesn't happen as often as you'd think the other is they quite often get acquired and that does happen more often than you might think and and you usually acquisition means a client goes away almost overnight because that that's kind of the nature of acquisition so i'm i'm driving it all the time i keep having to feed the sausage machine because you you know <laughs> the, the the big clients might pop out of the top yeah. um but i i do I do think quite hard about how, how do you scale a business that where close touch and communication is so important. You know, it's quite hard to keep your arms around it. How do you structure that? Probably we need, to, we'll, if we get much bigger than we are, we'll need to break down into teams so that clients get allocated to teams because it, it, how many client relationships can you keep spinning all at the same time when you're trying to do it at the level of kind of intimacy that we're trying to do it. So um, I think about these things a lot, Helmut. Thank you. <laughs> good. Thank you very much for sharing uh, so good insights and details, Luis. Um, yeah, I think we are approaching uh, the end of uh, today's webinar. 
and uh, let me thank, uh, say thank you to the uh, audience uh, for joining our webinar. And uh, if you are interested, uh, please check out uh, the upcoming publications in the XU magazine, uh, issue 20. If you have not subscribed to it, uh, it is entirely free. Click on the website of the XU magazine, get your digital copy. Or if you are on one of the next uh, events, major events for accountants, um, just look out for these guys. They are all around. Uh, and. Um, having normally uh, hard copies of the magazines with them. Luis, thank you very much um, for getting up You're such welcome. early in the UK. <laughs> I, I'm still waiting for the sun to come up. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, likewise. And um, once again, thank you very much uh, to our listeners today. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, talking to you soon again or meet you in person on one of the upcoming shows. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Helmut. And uh, good night, Australia and New Zealand. Good. Bye-bye.